As many Yu-Gi-Oh players know, Konami the game's parent company is not the most involved with the player base. We're often frustrated by their decisions, especially considering how much better the European branch seems to handle player interaction. However, within the past year, Konami has been steadily improving its communication with players, and while there's still more work to do, it's important to talk about how far they've come. So what has Konami done to improve its communication with Yu-Gi-Oh players? Let's talk about it today on Draw 5 Move 5. Hey everyone, and welcome to the table. My name is Gabe, and this is Draw 5 Move 5, a show where we draw connections between the mechanics behind our favorite games. August 10th and 11th saw the last of this year's Yu-Gi-Oh! competitive season come to a close, as duelists who earned their invite arrived in Berlin, Germany for the World Championship. One big surprise this year was that Konami invited a variety of influencers from the community, YouTubers who talk about Yu-Gi-Oh! Yugi tubers as we lovingly call them, had never been given invitations before, especially not with travel and accommodations provided. Those not at the event saw it from a new perspective as some of our favorite Yugi tubers created content in partnership with Konami, revealing crazy new cards live from the event, showcasing product contents early, and talking with Konami representatives, other tubers, and players. This unprecedented event capped off an 8 month streak of positive change in the company's relationship with us the fans, content creators, and players. 2018 was easily one of the worst years Yu-Gi-Oh! has experienced in a while. The Megatins, reprint sets designed to give players cards at a cheaper price, quickly lost value as the most expensive cards within were reprinted in other sets. First turn kills, or FDKs, were running rampant, and despite growing tournament attendance, the players did not feel like Konami was listening to our pleas. It took months for Supreme King Starving Venom, the card which was enabling an FTK in Pendulum Magician, a deck plenty powerful without it, to be banned, and Fireball Dragon, a card causing problems left and right, responsible for two prominent FTKs, seemed to almost have plot armor protecting it from the ban list. It was frequently used in marketing campaigns and portrayed as a major monster in the current anime. While thousands rallied on Konami's official accounts for the card to be banned, we lost faith they would listen. But on December 3rd, 2018, something incredible happened. Something had shifted within Konami. The next ban list went into effect and Fireball Dragon was banned. Konami finally seemed like they had open ears. And since then, we've seen a variety of positive changes that indicate Konami is finally listening to the players. Easily the most noticed change, Konami's approach to the ban list has shifted in line with players' hopes and expectations. While rarely even now will they affect newer cards, starting with their ban of Firewall, the mentality behind the list has changed. Before we would talk about cards that were problematic, but lament that it wasn't the Konami way to affect these cards. They usually hit cards around the issue rather than the problem itself. A good example of this was the limit of A Assault Core on September 2018's ban list. A Assault Core is part of a deck known as ABC, a series of Yu-Gi-Oh monsters based on Kaiba's original XYZ Dragon Cannon cards from the anime. The deck is enjoyed by many as a rogue pick, but there was a loop with multiple copies of A Assault Core that was only a problem because of, once again, Fireball Dragon. A, when sent to the graveyard, can add another Union monster from the graveyard to the hand, including a different copy of A Assault Core. On its own, this wouldn't be an issue. However, Fireball Dragon's ability to summon a monster from the hand when a monster it points to is sent to the graveyard allows players to loop these two copies of A Assault Core, and in combination with a burn card such as Cannon Soldier, which tributes a monster to deal 500 damage to the opponent, a loop was formed that reduced the opponent's life points to zero in one turn. Rather than hitting the card that allowed, frankly, degenerate looping of cards, because plenty of decks were capable of such a thing with Fireball Legal, Konami chose instead to limit A Assault Core. When Fireball was banned on the next list, A was immediately brought back to 3, almost an acknowledgement that other cards were being punished because Konami refused to ban Fireball for what were likely marketing reasons. Since the December 3rd ban list, all subsequent lists have taken aim at cards that are creating unfair game states in addition to the usual consistency hits to the top decks. It's important to address that by Yu-Gi-Oh terms, assembling a board of 3 or 4 negation effects in the first turn is not really broken, in the same way that setting up a variety of floodgate and trap cards does the same thing for slower stun decks in the game. 
Konami's ban lists can hit cards that outright prevent play in an unfair way, such as banning Topologic Gumbar Dragon and Heroic Challenger Rongominiad on the January list, which left no cards in the opponent's hand to use and create a complete lockdown of any opposing actions, respectively, and later the Phantom Knight's Rank Up Magic launch, which allowed players to summon a monster on the opponent's turn that prevented them from using monster effects entirely. Additionally, fan favorites, which are no longer as powerful as they used to be, are being released with each passing list. Elemental hero Stratos, which was banned for years and spawned the colloquial term Stratos, referring to any monster that can search an archetypal card on summon, is now at semi-limited status. Fans love heroes, and are glad to see the card back. El Shadal Construct, a powerful boss monster back in the day, multiple copies, was released to limited from its banned status, in support of another fan favorite deck and Tempest, Dragon Ruler of Storms, was just released to Limited on July's list. Dragon Rulers are a fan favorite, and people are ecstatic the card is back. It really feels like Konami is listening when it comes to the ban list. Konami is also producing better products for their players and communicating about said products more. Structure decks, products with a set list of cards that are designed to be playable and competitive right out of the box, have been rather lackluster the past few years. However, 2019 saw this change immediately. The past three structure decks, Soulburner, Order of the Spellcasters, and Rocket Revolt, have all lived up to the structure deck's promise. Buy three copies, adjust the cards you play as necessary, and you'll have a semi-competitive deck. Konami of America has also been keeping the best reprints that Konami Japan includes when they design these structure decks, such as Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring and Soulburner, Droll and Lockbird and Pot of Desires in Order of the Spellcasters, and Twin Twisters and Red Reboot in Rocket Revolt. These are all highly competitive cards that have their uses in a variety of formats, and can sometimes be expensive. These structure decks put that power into any player's hands, unlike in years past where, in the structure decks move from the original card game in Asia to the trading card game in Europe and the Americas, these competitive cards were replaced. Beyond this, we have better reprint sets in the TCG than in years past. April's Dual Power reprinted some of the most competitive cards to put them in more players' hands, deflated the price of fan-favorite decks that were expensive because their components were hard to come by, such as Necroz, and imported cards from the OCG we were all excited to play. Not to mention classic cards with new artwork, such as Dark Magician and Stardust Dragon, as promotional cards in every box. Battles of Legend Heroes Revenge was similar, good reprints, good imports, and good coolant for some expensive cards. This year's Megatons are slated to be fantastic, with promos that appeal to all players between competitive TCG exclusives, OCG imports with art by Kazuki Takahashi, creator of Yu-Gi-Oh!, and reprints of iconic cards, in addition to reprinting cards from the past year in new rarities to make them not only more accessible, but to give deserving cards a shiny new look, and maintain the value on some older cards that were already in foil. Let's face it, if we're going to play a game with cardboard, we'd like it to at least be shiny cardboard. And Konami's communication with these sets has been top notch. On March 28th, Konami published an article on their blog. They not only let us know a better range of when the Forbidden and Limited list would be released, a communication which also was unprecedented and that many of us would love to see and hear more of, but the PS note at the end let players know that a Necroz card that had appeared to miss a reprint with the rest of the archetype in Dual Power would receive one in Battles of Legend Heroes Revenge in July. In addition, since Heroes Revenge, Konami has been revealing the entire setlist early for their new products before they even hit shelves, beating leaks the community is used to by releasing that info themselves. This is an amazing and appreciated move. And on the subject of leaking their own product info, there was no greater example than Konami's move to invite YugiTubers to Worlds and show them new cards in addition to opening some Megatons early, showing us some of the cards inside and their rarity, hyping the community up even more for the product. This collaboration with YugiTubers, some of whom have audiences in the hundred thousands, is another fantastic step of communication with the community. Seeing some of our favorite Yu-Gi-Oh personalities sharing their perspectives and experiences makes us even more excited to play the game we love. Despite the positives, however, there's still work to be done for Konami to be truly involved with the community it has created. While inviting Yu-Gi-Tubers to the World Championship this year was a great move, who they did and didn't invite was… puzzling. All of the creators who went deserve the chance to go. They work hard at what they do, regardless of the size of their channels. And several of them, such as Simply Unlucky and Team APS, are huge names in the community, with half a million and 150,000 subscribers respectively. However, there are a variety of other YouTubers with similar numbers, such as Team Samurai X1 with 215,000 subs, Simo with 165,000, and DZF with 108,000 who produce equally amazing content who would love to have that relationship with Konami, but who weren't invited despite their influence. 
Whether or not we or Konami like these content creators is subjective, and whoever you do or don't enjoy, that is totally fine. But the numbers are objective. And from a marketing standpoint, bigger audiences mean bigger engagement. It was a missed opportunity to say the least, one that hopefully won't be squandered again. Engaging with even more creators will help the game grow and help Konami make even more money. It's a win-win. Additionally, there are some issues that fans still won't address and that Konami will not openly communicate with us about. New end of match procedures, colloquially called the time rules, were introduced in the summer of 2018 and caused a major upset in the community. When time in the round is called, games used to continue for five turns before deciding a victor. We've moved to finishing the current phase of the player's turn, where whoever has higher life points at the end wins the game and then the match winner is determined. Although tournament length has decreased, the new rules have created a ton of issues related to slow play, stalling until time is called, and discrepancies over whether or not people are in the battle phase in order to avoid battle damage. Many players wish we could finish the turn at the very least instead of the phase. And finally, we have short printing, a phenomenon where certain cards of the same rarity are less likely to be pulled than their counterparts in a set. These short printed cards are almost always competitive cards that many players need, such as Appaloosa, both the Goddess and Rising Rampage. It's harder to pull than other secret rares, of which there are only two per box, and because the rest of the set is fairly lackluster, aside from the new rarity introduced, which was a smart move for maintaining the product's value over time as it's exclusive to the first edition print of the set, it's not worth buying the set just to find one copy of Appaloosa. Buying a box, $60 worth of product, doesn't even guarantee the player will find the Appaloosa, let alone enough cards to make up the box's cost. At that point, they're better off buying a copy of the card on the secondary market, where at the moment it costs slightly less than a box. This pushes people away from buying the product. Why waste money on a box where a player probably won't find what they need when they could buy the card outright and save the trouble? Konami has yet to acknowledge short printing even exists, but math across hundreds of cases of product opened the past few years proves this phenomena is happening. Honesty would at least make fans feel better, but what we all hope for is to stop this intentional short printing of cards that everyone wants to have access to. It doesn't sell the sets better, it just puts the cards in fewer people's hands. Specifically, the people who can afford to have them. While the problems I've mentioned are important to address, and there are more I could talk about, trust me, Konami has been making strides to improve its relationship with fans this year. It's important to acknowledge this and let them know we're listening and appreciative if we want change to continue. I'm looking forward to the rest of this Yu-Gi-Oh year. We've got another fantastic reprint set coming up on the horizon in Dual Devastator, a powerful booster box coming up, and the potential for an even better relationship with Konami. If they keep listening like they have, things can only get better from here. Thank you so much for watching. You have my humble and eternal gratitude. What did you think of the conversation? If you're a Yu-Gi-Oh player, do you feel like Konami has improved this year? And if you're not, how do you feel about the companies that run the games you play and the ways in which they're involved with you and your community? I'd love to hear your thoughts, so let's keep this discussion rolling down in the comments. If you enjoyed the conversation and you want to hear more from me, subscribe and ding -a that notification bell so you never miss an update. I'm putting out new videos every week on games and gaming mechanics, and dropping a like lets me know you want to see more. My name is Gabe, this is Draw5Move5, and until next week, go have a good game.